realized that they weren't here for it. Um, I will right. record you in first person. What is this quality? There you go. It's Maybe. like it should be 1080p. Well, you playing Discord. Minecraft, bro? I don't Holy think shit! This many people looking at it. <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, you, it should, looks really you should lower it because uh, Discord like can't handle it. Really? And it makes it look worse. Actually, That's it's really so weird. Literally playing I mean, Minecraft. Oh, that's better. <laughs> yeah, that looks way better. It's I, I didn't boy, change anything. Yeah. I didn't change. Wait, anything. what? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, you stood still, I guess. This yeah, yeah, he's bad. Bad. As soon as you move, it's just gonna like, be if like, ah, oh, shit. Go to my shit. fucking house and use that playing just to say Professor Magblade is speaking. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So first of all, we're just gonna talk about the most basic thing. What is Magcro good for? So. Essentially, in this patch, Magcro is pretty much the best class for DPS, in my opinion, for a couple reasons. Um, for one, it provides the most essential skill in the entire game, like, in terms of one particular skill, and that is Glacial Colossus. So if you look at any endgame community, any endgame comp slash team, they're always going to have at least three Necros so they can drop Colossus. The reason you do this, I'm sure all of you already know, is for major vulnerability. When you apply this, it hits... Uh, for 12 seconds, increasing their damage taken by 10%, which is a pretty good amount. Um, you're usually going to have at least three... <laughs> you pretty. Pretty. Anyway, um, you're going to have at least three crows that are dropping Colo. You might even have six Necros in a team, and those three will be DPS. That's the other reason Necros is so good. They arguably have the highest single target damage in the game right now. Perhaps, debatably, Sork has a bit more, but it's really close, and Macro has more cleave. So essentially, I'm just trying to argue, you should play Magcro if you want to play just for the meta. Alright, so the first thing we're going to go over is like the real basics, like the setups. So what you should be using when, stuff like that. Um, first, we'll just talk about your average dropping Necro at Colossus. So let's say you've signed up for like, I don't know, a VSS. And the team or the raid leader asks you to say, or asks you to be on a Necro that is a full damage spec, but is dropping Colo. So what would you use? Well. You would probably use something like this. So you'd have Sororia, Perfected or Imperfect, both work. And you'd have that on your three-piece body and staff. The reason you have it on the staff is you don't want to have to proc this at the wrong time. You want to be able to control the proc. And the other reason is if you're using Mother's Sorrow, you'll lose damage if you lose the five-piece on off the back bar. So like if you have, I don't know, three jewels and a Mother's Sorrow staff, like for instance right here, um, you will see that like I have five piece, but if I swap to back bar, I'll lose spell crit because I don't have well not there because I have the body pieces. But you would lose a lot of spell crit when you're on the back bar. This is also problematic for Necro because we're on the back bar quite a bit, so it is far better to just use a perfected Sororia staff on the front bar. I know it's a pain to get these things, but it is for sure worth it. Obviously, Maelstrom back bar can't go wrong there. Zahn is your usual monster set for parsing on a dummy, but I will confess I don't think I have ever used Zahn in a raid ever except for VKA. That's like the only place I've ever used it So what would you use instead of Zahn? Um, in my opinion the best option for most content and this is gonna be a little controversial is Maw So Maw in my opinion is really good because of the simple fact that it is completely AFK ability like you just I mean, I just hit anything, and Maul will come out and start doing damage. Maul. There it is. It's doing damage. I could be playing mechanics. I could be grabbing the Horfrost right here, and that Maul is still breathing on the skeleton while I do nothing. So it is really good. I asked Crazy Cans the Lord, and he told me that Maul is for sure best in slot for Cloud Rest. So basically, anywhere that you have multiple targets, or if you're at like a range a decent amount, you want to be using Maul the Infernal. It's just a lot easier to use. It's not like, there's no conditions to it. You don't have to be in any kind of close range or proximity. It's just free damage. And it's only like, I think like 2K behind Zahn, which is a very small difference. In a raid, you would never even notice it. And if for any reason you're Zahn, like if I'm here, let's say it's like Cloud Rest and I have to like do something, my Zahn can't hit from here. So Maul is probably gonna pull ahead. If you, if you ever have to walk away for any reason, the Maul is probably gonna pull ahead. Okay, so we have the gear set up. I mean, it's the same as anyone else. You just use Sororia Mother Sorrow or like Sororia Medusa. So let's talk about Medusa versus Mother Sorrow real quick. So why would you use Mother Sorrow? Why would you use Medusa? Well, if you can use Mother Sorrow, like if you're in melee range, you should. It is more damage. You get more Magicka. You get more crit. You get the 5-1-1 bonus. You're going to have more health because you can run... Well, if I was on Medusa, right, I'd have to run a Light Maul. But if I'm on a uh, Mother Sorrow setup, I can run a heavy maul and a medium maul, two piece. 
This gives me more Magicka, it gives me more health, so I'm more survivable. It gives you more stamps you can roll and block more. It's just better. The only problem with Mother Star is you have to use Trap or Channel Acceleration. But this isn't an issue. If you're in melee range, Trap is actually very helpful because it gives you more sustain. Because when you get to use a free skill like uh, Barb Trap, for instance, it's a stam skill, so it doesn't take from our primary resource Magicka. And therefore, it's going to increase our sustain. So in that one GCD, we're not using Magicka. It gives our Magicka some breathing room. So basically, Maw is gonna, be, or Maw and Mother Sorrow are your bread and butter for like Perry with Soria for most content. But Medusa does have its place. So it can Cloud Rest, for instance. I very much prefer Medusa because Medusa has the advantage of not having to use Trap. So the thing is, in Cloud Rest, yes, you are on the tail quite a bit. But like using trap is kind of a pain. And the other thing is in Cloud Rest, we pre-lay our dots on the tail, like before we get over there, right? So all those dots are gonna be ticking without minor force if our trap is down. But with Medusa, they would be ticking with minor force, so it's worth it. It's also just like an ease factor. Like I can slot a heal, and in Cloud Rest, you often want to heal. Like if you're a portal backup or just a portal DPS, you're gonna want to heal in your bar. So like you wanna drop the force GCD for a heal. So I hope that clears up a little bit of Medusa versus Mother Sorrow. I'd say both the mini trials, Medusa is for sure better. I would rather use Medusa and like fast, for instance, I would want to use channeled. Like basically anywhere where you don't want to have to use a minor force GCD slash channel slash bar trap, you want Medusa. It's a tiny DPS loss, like one to 2K, but if you're in full melee range and you can just parse, then yeah, use Mother Sorrow with trap. It is going to be better. All right, so the next um, probably most debated question for macro, for setup at least, is should I use the dot build or should I use the skull build? There's not really a perfect answer, but I'm just going to go over which situations the dot build is better and which situations the skull build is better. And then once I go over that, we're gonna the next thing we'll talk about is like dot priority slash like how to do the dot rotation because it is a little like strange. If you haven't done like a lot of dot rotations, because like most classes aren't dot rotations, they have like a lot of spammable uses like DK, you're whipping a lot. Nightblade, you're doing a lot of like Ellie Weapon or Swallow Soul. Sork, you're obviously doing a lot of Forest Pulse slash Crystal Frags. Like, I guess Templar, you're doing a lot of jabs. Like, Pro is one of those classes where it's weird. You're not doing a lot of spam bulls. And we'll get into why that is and uh, how to best do the dot build. But first, we'll just talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the dot build versus the skull build. Okay, so in terms of absolute pure single target, the dot build does pull ahead. So if I pull up a parse, this is the highest parse I've pulled on Crow so far. Um, 106k this is with the dot build so the dot build is stronger for a couple reasons for one it's passive damage kind of the way maw is so like let's say i'm ever doing mechanics if i have all my dots on this dummy and i don't know someone's like oh lose hoar frost i'm like oh shit and i go over there all my dots are still ticking like yeah i'm not going to be using a gcd but if i was using the skull build for instance I'm losing a lot more damage, right? Because I don't have all my dots on this target. Like, if all your dots are on a target and you have to do something else that's, like, not damage-related for a second, this will preserve more of that damage with the dot build. So where is the dot build good? The dot build is good, um, in my opinion, mostly on, like, static targets. So, like, if you're fighting Yolnokrin, for instance, you want to use the dot build. So anywhere you can, like, just parse your heart out, the dot build is going to be better. Okay, enjoy a crew. That's fine. Anywhere the dot build is like going to be stronger is going to be like Sunspire. I pretty much use the dot build everywhere. Even Loki, you could arguably use it. But yeah, in general, for static targets, the dot build will pull in single. So why would you use the skull build? Well, so the skull has the added benefit of being able to do um, more immediate burst damage. So like Degen is the, the only difference between the, the dot build and the skull build, by the way, is you pretty much just drop either Degen or Scalding, one of your two mages guild dots for Ricochet Skull. And so Ricochet Skull, it actually is a pretty strong spammable. It hits quite a bit. Like, as you can see, the tooltip is basically as strong as Ellie Weapon, and it gets 20% increased damage on the third cast. So why would you use a Skull? Well, let's say I'm in Cloud Rest, right? I know I just used the dot build example for Horfrost like, as like a strength, but in Cloud Rest, I actually use the Skull bit more. So the Skull build is good because A, it has more cleave, because on the third cast of Ricochet, one, two, Three, there's no other target, but it would bounce to like let's pretend imaginary with another enemy. It would bounce off this dummy into imaginary and it would do damage to both of them. Um, the skull build is also nice if you need to like burst something down. So let's say like a creeper is over there. If I have the dot build, I have to be like, well, okay, I guess I put all my fucking dots down and pray. 
But if I have the skull build, I can pretty much just be like, oh, let me just cast a couple skulls, and if my teammates do the same thing, it's just gonna die. So basically, really, when you hmm? a really good example of that is the the like prisons in like VKA. Yep. Uh, it's so jank on dot builds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Like anything that you need, like more immediate damage, like. Yeah, exactly. Like, what I imagine you just saying, groups had skull build benefits for more immediate burst damage. That's 100% true. So, if you need immediate burst for any reason, the skull is going to be better. So, Protector. another place where the skull is 1000% better is like Vast. So, like Asylum Sanctorium plus two, you 100% want the skull build. And the reason why is dots have this thing where they're only really worth it if you get the full duration of them. If I'm like, let's say I have six seconds to do damage to this dummy. Am I really gonna cast a bunch of 10 second dots? It doesn't make much sense, right? <clears throat> It'd be better for me just to cast skulls. So ultimately, it's kind of a preference thing. You can use the dot build or a skull build anywhere. You could never use a dot build if you want to. You could never use a skull build if you want to. They both work anywhere. It's just that like some are gonna be more optimal than others. So in my opinion, the two mini trials, AKA VCR slash VAS2, um, are gonna be the places where you wanna use a skull build. And for the other places, like. VKA, VSS, even like VMAL, like the lower, um, not like as insane DLC trials, I would probably use the dot build. The dot build is just more damage in general, and we'll go over why like about now. So why is the dot build so strong? Well, first of all, we have a bunch of cool passives. So we have two mages guild abilities, structure entropy and scalding rune. With this, we get to use all, take advantage of all these mages guild passives. So like on the front part, we have two mages guild skills. So that's giving us 2% max mag per ma uh, mages guild ability. So on the front bar, we have one, two, three. So that's 6% max mag just for having three skills. That's pretty good. That's actually kind of a lot of mag. The other thing we get is empower, which is really cool. So if I use degen or scalding, as you can see in the bottom left, I get this little empower like proc. It's right next to my Sporia stacks under my health bar. Empower will increase the damage of your light attacks. So whenever we use these two dots in our rotation, we're getting more light attack damage. So it's almost a quasi like spammable improvement, but not a, not quite. Anyway, so yeah, basically the dot build has some really cool passives. The other thing is Necro inherently is really good with dots because of this rapid rot. So it increases your damage with damage overtime effects by 15%. That is a lot like that's an actual ton so it makes sense that a dot crow would be optimal because we have this super strong passive so what dots do you use and what's the priority well we have a bunch of dots in this rotation we have structure entropy detonating siphon and we'll go into why it's detonating not mystic in a second here avid boneyard slash unnerving boneyard depending on like whatever if you're parsing on a dummy always use avid but like either works in wraith Unstable Wall of Fire is a dot. Technically, this is not a dot, Skull to Arcanist, but like I tr you treat it like a dot because it lasts for 16 seconds and like it acts like a dot in a lot of ways. But yeah, this is just something in your rotation. This would be Mystic Orb, but I was playing Aurora Orb pro earlier, so like that's why. <laughs> but Mystic Orb is a dot. And Scalding Rune is also a dot. So we have one, two, kind of three, four, five, six, seven dots to keep track of. Now, that probably sounds really overwhelming, like, oh shit. On my Stork build, I have two dots to keep up. You want to keep up seven on a Necro? What the hell, man? Well, here's the thing. It's actually not so bad, and here's why. Okay, so the first thing that enables a dot build to be good is Rapid Rot, but the second thing is Blast Bones. So Blast Bones, as all of you guys know, like I'm sure you already all know this, but I don't know if I Blast Bones is really important. It's basically our spam bowl. So if we pull up that parse again, oh, I may have to do this. I mean, you can see that Blast Bones was like essentially as strong as our light attacks. It did 20k DPS in this parse. So Blast Bones is just kind of like, in a way, it's like free AFK damage once again, like on Crow, because you just click it and like two seconds later, it, it detonates. So we're using all of these dots and Blast Bones is essentially our quote unquote spammable because it's, it's, it's our burst damage while we do all these dots. This is what enables the dot build to work. If Necro didn't have Blast Bones, I mean, the damage would be absurdly lower. That's, that's true for the Skull build too, but even more so for the Dot build, because basically it's giving us free burst damage while we cast all these dots. So let's go over Dot priority. I mean, you can kind of basically see just looking at this parse what the priority is, but Mystic Orb is your second strongest dot, and you're gonna be like, what, second strongest? It's at the top. But so you would have Wall, because look at this, the explosion from Wall is 3.4K. Wall itself was 6K. So together, that's almost 10K DPS from Wall. So this is your priority. It's wall is your most important dot. 
for one thing, it does damage, and it's also our semi-spammable, because when we cast it again, it explodes, but I'll go into that in a second when I talk about like dot build rotation. But wall is a strong dot in general, but the most important part about it is it procs our weapon damage enchant. So on the back bar Maelstrom Staff, we have the infused weapon damage enchant. Um, wall will proc this for us, even when we're on our front bar. If I light attack in the wall, I get the proc. So it's really important to always keep this up. You never want your wall to fall off because it gives you that. The other reason wall is so strong, besides being an insane dot, is the Maelstrom's passive itself. So when you cast the wall with Maelstrom, your light and heavy attacks deal additional damage in your wall elements. So like, there's basically three really important reasons to keep this up slash cast it the most of all our dots. One, it's a quasi-spamble because it explodes when we cast it again. Two, it does a lot of damage on its own. Three, it procs the weapon damage enchantment. And four, it procs the Maelstrom special effect. So I, I, I obviously, like, there's just so much going for wall. Like, there's no reason not to make it our top priority dot. This thing can never fall off. It's really important to keep wall up. So Mystic Orb, why is Mystic Orb our second? Well, this is the healing orb, but as you can see, it ticks every half second, which is a lot. So if we replace the health with damage, because this is healing orb, it, it's a lot of damage. Basically, Mystic Orb is ticking rapidly, and it's doing a ton of damage. The other reason it's really good, it has really high cleave potential. Like you can even see with this healing orb, if I cast this, it's hitting all three of these guys. If they were enemies, it'd be hitting all three of them. So it's basically ticking, it's hitting a lot of area. It's a really strong single target dot. It's a really strong AoE dot. That's your second most important dot. The third most important dot is Boneyard. Why Boneyard? Well, it's just strong on its own. And the other reason is the Grave Robber synergy. So you or an ally, depending on like, if it's a raid or just by yourself, can use the, uh, um, the Boneyard synergy, Grave Robber. And if we look again, once again at this parse, Grave Robber does a lot of damage. Like, nine procs did 2k DPS. That's a lot. Like, that, that's, not, that's nothing to, like, fuck around with. That's pretty decent damage. So it's really good because if we add the 2k DPS from Grave Robber to Boneyard and treat it as one dot, it's essentially as strong as Mystic Orb. It's, like, 8k DPS total. So Boneyard is really important. Um, the other thing that's nice about it is, like, all Grave Lord abilities, you get the passive that gives you... Um, more critical chance so you want boneyard on your front bar for that reason but anyway boneyard is your third most important dot the fourth most important dot dot well like, it's not technically a dot but I'm, I'm just gonna call it a dot for these purposes is skull to arcanist so arcanist does pretty big damage once again going back to the parse if we look at this skull to arcanist which is death bolt by the way in this did 5.6k dps so it's almost as strong as wall minus the explosion proc, but it's almost as strong as wall's base damage. It's almost as strong as Boneyard's base damage. So Death Bolt is nothing to mess around with. And once again, like this has kind of been a repeating trend, but Skeletor Arcanist is like free AFK damage. You don't even have to move around. It's just doing damage for you, right? Like if I'm hitting this, my Skeletor Arcanist is now targeted on this guy. I'm just chilling here. He's going to constantly do damage to it. It's really nice. The other thing that's cool about Arcanist is it actually hits all enemies in the radius. So, like, let's see. If you look at the skill, it says the mage attacks the closest enemy every two seconds, dealing 2.7k shock damage to them and all other enemies nearby. So, let's say we're doing Cloud Rest, and imaginary is like Sororia, and this target dummy is Zamaja. If I'm chilling here on the tail, my Arcanist is hitting both these guys. So, it's really good for cleave. It's actually better in trial than, um, than what the dummy indicates. It's really good for single target, but it's really also insanely good for cleave. So you want to keep this thing up. The other reason it's important to keep this up is you may not always have blast bones up, and you'll get this passive. Let's see. When you have a blast bones, skull smash, or spirit mender active, your mag recovery is increased by 200, which is a fucking lot. That is a lot of mag recovery. So it's really important to keep this guy up because it'll help your sustain too. All right, so that's our fourth most important dot. The next most important dot is here, let me just make a corpse for this. Is detonating siphon. So. You can siphon whenever there's a corpse on the ground, like just there you saw my blast bones hit the dummy, and now I can siphon it. Siphon is your next most important dot. The reason it's a little behind um, Arcanist is, one, there's a conditional proc to it, i.e. there has to be a corpse on the ground, and it can be a bit of a pain sometimes, like there's not always a corpse there. Usually there is, but not, not always. And the other reason, it just does less damage than Arcanist, so essentially we're just using it because it does less damage. The best thing about Siphon, in my opinion, is actually the slotted passive. Uh, when you have it slotted, your damage is increased by 3%, which is a pretty noticeable chunk. So yeah, that's our, um, I guess, I think our fifth most important dot. Our sixth most important dot is uh, Degen slash Structure Entropy. It does a tiny bit more damage than Scalding Rune. It's also on our front bar, so it's just easier to keep it up, because we want to be on front bar as much as possible. So if you have to early refresh between either Scalding Rune or Structure Entropy, you would typically pick Structure Entropy. 
All right, so that's all of our dot priority. Now let's talk about the most important part of doing uh, Necro, and that is the two skill Blast Bone effect. So Blast Bones is, like I said, your most important damaging skill. Um, once again, <laughs> looking at the pars, it did 20k DPS with 63 casts. That is so much. Like to give you perspective, if we look at Mystic Orb, Boneyard, Unstable Wall, and Death Bolt, all of those combined are roughly the same DPS as Blast Bones. Like, that is pretty insane. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but like these three dots together are like the same DPS as Blast Bones. So even if you dropped all three of these dots, Blast Bones is essentially as strong as those three dots combined. That is really next level powerful. So what does that mean for us practically? Well, what it means is, let's say I'm on my wall, right? I'm just going to refresh for a little bit. Let's tick down. So we're at seven seconds, right? Let's pretend I have, I don't know, two seconds left on wall or I have to class Blast Bones. It's much better to cast Blast Bones than any other dot. You never do this. Like you would never reapply another dot and then Blast Bones. You always do two skills, Blast Bones, no matter what. Now, there is one condition to this. If you're not in range, like if I'm all the way back here, Blast Bones turns into three skills. It's based on your range. But if I'm relatively close to it, like right here, it's going to be two skills, like one, two, Blast Bones, right? So that's your GCDs. Basically, what I mean is, Never refresh a dot if it means you're not going to get the two skill blast bones. And what two skill blast bones means is you do blast bones, skill, skill, blast bones. So you always do two skills and a blast bones. Um, I would never do this. I would never do blast bones. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to cast a wall. But look, my blast bones is detonated. Right? So that's not good. It's never good to cast a dot over blast bones. Blast bones is always your number one priority, no matter what. Always, always, always. So Blast Bones is stupid powerful. Let's go over why. So it does insane single target damage as we saw 20k DPS on that dummy parse, but it also hits everything around it. So like if all these guys are pretty close to this skeleton, they're all getting hit too. And it's hitting them for full damage. Like it, it's it's actually really cracked. Like if I'm fighting, like let's say it's like Roll, like Captain Roll from VKA, all his little ad buddies that are on him, they all get blown the fuck up by Blast Bones too, just like him. So it's really important to keep Blast Bones up. It's your top source of cleave. It's your top source of single target. It's just so strong. Never miss Blast Bones cast. It's so important. Never, never, never. As much as you possibly can. Like, yeah, it, it happens sometimes in a raid. Like, if you mess up, it's okay. Like, don't beat yourself up if it happens. But just, like, remember, always two skill Blast Bones. You'll get into a rhythm of it. Two skill Blast Bones. Okay. So the other reason it's important to cast Blast Bones is it gives you a, a corpse for Siphon. Um, if you rely on the corpse that you get from your fallen Arcanist, it's kind of off, like, you can see how the Arcanist is off to my side a little bit. It's kind of annoying, right? It's like, if I, let's, I'm going to recast it here in a second. Okay, so now there's a corpse on the ground. If I siphon this corpse, it's not going to hit this skeleton. It's going to siphon from this guy, and it's going to be doing no damage. But if I blast bones this guy, kaboom, and I siphon him, that's hitting the target. So it's really important to, to siphon your blast bones corpse, which, I mean, if you just look at the target, it will do. But I'm just saying that's another reason it's important to cast blast bones. Other reason it's important to cast Blast Bones, like besides the obvious damage effects, is for Boneyard, if you consume a corpse on cast, i.e. if I throw a Blast Bones, it detonates, and then I have Boneyard, it does 50% more damage with this dot. So that's really strong. Another uh, just a quick tip about that, Siphon also consumes corpses, by the way, guys. So if I throw a Blast Bones, and if I siphon first and then Boneyard, the Boneyard no longer gets the 50% damage increase because it's just got the siphon consumed the corpse. So now it's just a regular Boneyard. So if you're doing your dot rotation and you blast bones, and like both of these are about to fall off, right? Always do Boneyard first. Boneyard is much stronger than siphon. Let the next blast bones come and then siphon that one. Okay, so always do Boneyard instead of blast bones first. It's much more important. All right, so for this next bit, I'm gonna pull up a YouTube video um, this way we can like pause and look at the damage done and a dummy parse. So this is going to be kind of our dummy humping question. Before I go and play this video for us to like analyze, is there any questions slash anything like that? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. like the range on Blast Bones, like how, how is it that you're able to tell when it's going to be three casts ah. as opposed okay. to two? So essentially, it, it's like melee versus ranged. So it's a little closer than like, I don't know, pretend I have blood for blood on. Like that range is pretty short, right? Like this is like blood for blood range. Yeah. So it's like melee spamble range. Obviously, it's going to be two skills here. I believe it should be two skills here. 
No, it's actually three skills here. So yeah, if you get um, a little bit further out, it's three skills. So basically anything past this, like, I think this is six meters. Anything past this, like, six to seven meter range is going to be three skills. So that's, like, yeah, that's kind of annoying, right? Like, so basically... If so you're if you're in, like, a range position, like, in a raid or something, you're, you're going to be doing three skill boss bombs. Yes. Yeah, you will be. So, like, for instance, I actually encountered this in my Dawnbringer prog. I am a ranged, and I'm, I'm a Nightblade yeah. in that prog, but, like... I came on my Necro one day just for fun. Um, on Fallgraven, if my melee partner is here, I was like here, and let's pretend the, the, the target is uh, Fallgraven, I had to switch to a three skill Blast Bones rotation, and that is pretty rough, because the other thing is, Blast Bones is actually a really cheap spam bolt. Um, it's like, if you cast it twice, like there's a passive, I think it's in Great Board. Sure. Yeah, so reusable parts is this passive. When you use your Blast Bones and like it dies, the next Blast Bones, is 50% cheaper. So it goes from being a 2k cost to like a 1.2k cost. That's like so cheap. It's actually crazy. It's part of why the sustain is better. But like when you have three skill blast bones, it, it indirectly nerfs your sustain kind of because your blast bones aren't being cast as much. So you're not getting the proc as often. But yeah, basically if you're ranged, you're gonna be in a uh, three skill blast bones situation. But here's the thing. In my opinion, there is no content in this game where you have to be at this range to do damage. So even if you're a ranged DPS, like let's say it's VKA, you're supposed to be ranged, quote unquote, right? But all that really means is you're like a bitch, like you're like the buff bitch. Like I, I hate to say it, but it's true. Like if you're ranged, it basically just means you're the bitch. So like, let's say Imaginary is my melee partner. Right now we're doing damage together. That's fine. Like if this is VKA, there's really nothing I'm hurting him by doing this here. But let's say a mechanic comes out like instability. I just roll back, take the instability, boom, and then come back in. So like ultimately with pro, even if you're a ranged position, the Rayleigh is gonna understand that it's better to be in melee range for you as much as possible. So like even if let's say Kaz you're assigned a, a range, just play up in melee and just go out for mechanics. Like, if you get a meteor, just oh okay, block, come back, just come back in. It's always better to stay in melee range. It just is. So like there really isn't any situation in this game where you're gonna be forced into a three skill blast rotation. I can say that very confidently with like thousands of hours on crow i can probably count on one hand the amount of times i've actually been forced into a three skill last rotation right so that it's it's pretty like irrelevant you just want to be like on the boss and it will always be two skills like if you're in this kind of like zone like a nice radius where you should be like stacked with the group stacked with the heals your blast ones will basically always be two skills i hope that clears that up mm -hmm. any other questions before we move on to the uh parse analysis are okay. you using the stem uh, more for siphon yeah i am using the stand more for siphon so let's talk about why that that's actually a good point and is vampire both okay so we'll talk about both of those first okay so why the stand morph so detonating siphon you might be like what the heck <laughs> like why am i using a stand morph on a macro well here's the thing this actually is not a stam skill like as you can see it does not cost stamina the same way mystic siphon does not cost magicka it's actually a free skill which is also another reason crow has insane sustain is it gets a free skill like every now and then so why, why Dead Siphon, right? Well, so even though it's not a Stam or Mag skill, it does still scale a, a Mystic, or I should say Mystic Siphon still scales a little better because we have in our champion points. Yeah. Uh, Mystic Siphon benefits from this. Elemental Expert, it benefits from, well, really just Elemental Expert. So yeah, Elemental Expert boosts our Mystic Siphon damage by 13%. So you might be thinking, okay, we have zero points into Mighty, which increases disease damage, which is what Dead Siphon is. How the actual fuck... Oh wait, speaking of that, I just thought of something. If you're doing Thaumaturge, take out three piercing and just do three mighty, I think. Unless it doesn't get 1%. Eh, I guess it's three piercing. Whatever. Anyway, sorry, that was like a little on the fly thought. But anyway, so yes, yeah, so like you might be thinking like, oh, okay, Mystic Siphon scales better. Well, it does. So the actual damage of the Siphon itself, i.e. like the dot damage, so if I'm doing the Siphon... Okay, so in this moment, in this 12 second countdown, Right now, Mystic Siphon is doing more damage, but when this runs out, okay, like I'm just gonna force it early. Notice how that corpse just exploded. When this, when Detonating Siphon ends, you get a disease damage proc, so it's 5.7k disease damage in an explosion. When that corpse detonates after Siphon ends, you'll get that explosion, and the explosion damage you get after every Siphon, or after every Siphon I should say, outweighs the damage you get from Mystic Siphon at the beginning. So while Dead Siphon will do less damage than Mystic Siphon, very subtly by the way, like less than 500 DPS difference, um, while it's ticking, when the effect ends, it actually outweighs Mystic Siphon to the point of, um, let's see, 
So here's the, the damage from Detonating Siphon, right? 4k? Let me see if I have a Mystic Siphon first. Yeah, here's Mystic Siphon, 4.9k, right? So you might be like, oh, that's trash, like why use it? Well, Detonating Siphon does 1.7k with explosions. So this went from being a 4k dot to a 5.7k dot, which is almost right behind Avid Boneyard, like only 400 off, versus Mystic Siphon doing 4.96k. So it's a very small difference. It's like a 700 DPS difference, but it's free damage. Just take it, right? Like, so yeah, Dead Siphon is a little stronger. It does a tiny bit more damage, even on a macro. I know it's weird. This is a relatively like new concept in the macro community, but like, yeah, Dead Siphon actually does do a little more damage. So why, why would you use Mystic Siphon if you really wanted to? Well, Mystic Siphon gives you mag back while you're using it. Um, it's not an insane amount, and to be honest, I've been running Dead Siphon literally everywhere, including, like, Vass. I really have not noticed a sustain issue ever. So, like, yeah, I don't really think Dead Siphon is a problem. I think it's 100% worth it. It does more damage, and it's, it's free. It's just free damage. The other cool trick with Dead Siphon, we can get into this when we get into when we watch the parse, but, like, if you're an execute, and you don't want to spam walls or spam wall, like, if the thing's about to die, you can stay on the front bar, which has more spell power and more crit, and you can use Dead Siphon as your spam. It can just, um, it can dead and blow up, and you can force the early detonation. Like, as you saw there, I can, click, I can keep clicking it, and it will keep detonating. Like, over and over, right? So it's like a little, it's like a mini spam ball. I can force the thing to proc more. Like, on that dark, yeah, I can just force the detonation to proc early. Alright, so, I think that was Zarkus' question. Zarkus says, is Vampire build viable? Yes, Vampire build is 100% viable. So, what would you do on a Vampire build? You actually would not use Blood for Blood. You would keep using the dot build. I mean, unless you, like, wanted to use Blood for Blood. You still could. But max single target damage will be structure entropy build, like the dot build. You would drop the force GCD slash trap slash, like, channel acceleration and put the toggle there. It's so, like, where I have resistance flush, you'd have toggle. Everything else would be the exact same. You would have toggle. One thing you can do to make it a little easier is you can put braided tether somewhere on your bar. Like, I don't know, you could drop... Um, maybe inner light if you really wanted to and you could have braided tether and what that like own light did this in his yon parse and what braided tether does is it heals you an insane amount so you can keep up the vampire toggle ticks um so yeah vamp is toggle with pale order the build would look something like this so you'd have medusa two piece on the jewelry you'd put ring of the pale order on so you're like wait medusa jewelry isn't it heavy want to have heavy well yeah so what you would do is this Let's say you're doing like, I don't know, PFG. Let's just pretend it's like fast or something. You'd have false god on the entire body, right? Um, and you'd have a Medusa shoulder piece. You would use the Medusa Inferno staff if you have it. So this does require a bit of farming, by the way. And you would use a one piece medium to get crit. Like, so Zahn, a Zahn mask. Heavy shoulder of Medusa. So now I have the five piece Medusa. Boom. Now I'm ready to toggle. So why would you ever use toggle? Well, toggle is good in like score push environments and that's basically it. Or just like for fun on parsing. So I personally, in my groups that are like pushing God Slayer and like other trifectas, Dombringer, stuff like that, I have never toggled. Toggle is really only reserved for like, you're super score pushing, you're trying to get the highest parse on like a boss or something, then you would pull the toggle out. Otherwise, it's pretty risky. I'm not gonna lie, like toggle can definitely kill you. Um, Something like VKA, people do toggle in there for score pushing groups, but most groups would never fucking do that because it's so dangerous. You could just die on a cooldown, basically. Um, your, your health ticks really low, and Crow already has really low self heals. Like, yeah, you have Braided Tether, which is good, but compared to like a Nightblade or something, it's a lot riskier. So, so in, in short, Zarkus, it is viable, but it's not something I would recommend using in most situations. It's really only something you would use in specific raid comps. And it's only really going to be worth it with that, with that specific raid comp because they optimize for your toggle build. Otherwise, you're just probably going to die a lot most of the time. Hope that answers that question. Uh, anything else before I go into the video, or should we just do that? Does the rotation change and execute? It does, yeah. I'll go over that in the parts video. It's probably the easiest way to show that. Any uh, Anything else real quick before we go into the before You, I just show you that? said that you would use Maw for the most part. Yes. And then Zahn if it's just like a stay still fight but like what about vss would you switch to dami house yeah you would for sure use dami house yes that's a good question okay. so yeah zon can't proc on the dragons so you would use dami house there um avid or unnerving in situation yeah so in raid um avid doesn't really have the same benefit it does in raid 
I mean, yeah, you can take your own synergies. So you can, you might get a couple more bone yards than someone else, but unnerving actually still gives this synergy, great barber synergy. Um, except the thing is, it only gives it to your allies. So let's say imaginary has unnerving, and he casts his bone yard next to me. I can take his synergy, but he can't take his own synergy. But if I use my unnerving bone yard, he can take my synergy. So basically, if you have multiple crows in the group, it doesn't really matter anymore, right? It's like avid versus unnerving doesn't really matter anymore. They're basically the same thing. Everyone's gonna get synergies regardless. Like, see, I just took uh, my own there. But if Vortex casts his boneyard, I can take his boneyard synergy. Um, yeah, so essentially, it's nothing. There's nothing better about avid in raid. The thing if unnerving is it provides breach to the group in trash, so it will cast a major breach on all the ads. So unnerving technically is better for raid. But it doesn't really matter. You just need one crow on it. For parsing on a dummy, though, always avid, 100%. Because you want that synergy. You won't get it with a nerving. So always do avid on a dummy. Um, yeah. Anything else? And then for yeah. um, as far as, like, the crit passive and execute, what mm -hmm. if you're not at 100% you're at, like, 98 or 97? Would you just slot another Grave Lord to go over? Or is it okay to have, like, 97% crit? It is okay to have 97 crit. So basically... Um, this bar setup, my front bar setup, is the setup I would use on the dot build. Like, once again, go into that parse. Uh, these were my bar setups for this parse. So, like, as you can see, I have one, two, three um, abilities on the uh, front bar that are Grave Lord. My effective crit is 65.5%. My max is 68. So, when I'm on the front bar, I have 68% base crit. And when I'm on the front bar in execute, I would have 98.5% crit. How much of a difference is 98.5 between 100? Very small, like extremely small. So it doesn't really matter. Like there's nothing else you could really put here that would make it 100%. Like there really isn't anything. Now, obviously with the skull build, if I drop structure entropy and have the skull on the front bar, um, yeah, then you would have 100% crit in execute. But you shouldn't, you don't have to force it. Like it's not something I would force if that makes sense. In fact, I'd rather take Shooting Star for the mag passive um, because it's just going to be more damage throughout the whole fight rather than execute. Having 1.5% more crit is not going to make a huge difference. So do you always slot Shooting Star front bar and then Kalo back bar? Yes. So if you're using Colossus back bar, um, you're using... Yeah, if you're using Colossus, you're putting on back bar. Unless you're in, like, a Silent Sanctorium and you're using a Master Architect staff, like, on your front bar... Well then, yeah, you'd have Colossus on front bar in that situation. And you would just double bar Colossus, because then you get the crit passive back bar. Um, yeah. Anything else real quick before we go into the parse video? No? Okay. So I'm going to pull that up real quick, and we're going to like look at that. I'll pause and play and stuff like that, so we can uh, go over different sections. Okay. So, first of all, let me switch my stream so you guys can see the window. So this is a YouTube video of me doing a parse. It wasn't the 106K that I have in that uh, CMX, because I didn't record that one, unfortunately. But it is 105, so it's still a pretty good parse. And it's still going to be useful for our purposes here. All right. Everyone can see this, I'm hoping. Uh, the YouTube video, I mean. Yeah? OK. All right, so first of all, how do you start a parse on a dummy? Well, what you do is, I don't think I do I show it in the video? Let me see. Yeah, I do. Okay, so what you first, the first thing you do is my setup here is Sororia Mother Sorrow, right? And I have the dot build. What you do is you do a pre buff channeled. I learned this from like Clive and Bread. And by the way, if you do this in a parse, we will 100% tag you. It's not considered pre buffing, it's just like a thing. So you pre buff a channeled to get the uh, minor force. And then what you do is this you look at the dummy, you summon your Arcanist, you don't click Blast Bones yet, you cast Orb. Right? You run up to the dummy. This is a very advanced uh, thing to do, by the way. This is like just in case you really, really want to optimize your dummy parse. So you, you cast orb backwards, like behind you, so that it um, reaches the dummy and everything takes at once. Then you clasp blast bones. You do scalding, destro, wall. Everything hits at once. All right, so that's, that's just like the sweaty opening. Don't pay too much like, attention to that. We're just going to go over dot priority. So here, as you can see, what I am doing is I am just casting every dot on cooldown pretty much. And um, I am using Blast Bones every two skills. The reason I'm not casting Trap yet is because I still have 10 seconds, as you can see there, on my uh, Minor Force from Channeled. So yeah, as you can see, you're basically overcasting dots a lot. Like most rotations, you wouldn't be casting uh, your dots this early. Like if you're on a Sork or something, you wouldn't be overcasting the dots this much. 
But on macro, you can see even when I'm overcasting, things are going to fall off. So rule number one of parsing with dot build, expect dots to fall off, right? Like it, it's going to happen. You can't keep all seven of these up 100% of the time always. It, it's just not going to happen. Like it's unrealistic to think that it will. So just be prepared for that and don't beat yourself up if one of these drops. It's okay. But if things drop, what should your priority be? Well, we kind of talked about this already. But if your degen and your scalding fall off, that is 1000% okay. They're the weakest dots. So it's if, if you're going to make anything fall off, like let's say I had a choice between, I don't know, Arcanist and degen, I would 100% refresh Arcanist first. Like if you're in a rotation spot where it's like, oh, I need to refresh one first, do Arcanist first. And the reason you get into these, into these situations, by the way, is because we have to always two skills blast bones. Like as you can see, no matter what, I'm always doing two skill blast bones. I always get back to my front bar. I'm always clicking blast bones, no matter what blast bones. So the thing is, though, right? Because I had to click this blast bones, like you can see, my wall is gonna fall off. My trap is gonna fall off because I had to click blast bones. But it's worth it because blast bones is just so strong. It's okay for these to fall off a bit as long as I get the blast bones proc. Is basically what I'm trying to say. So now I'm in this situation, what am I going to do? Well, I can already predict this without telling you. I'm going to do wall and trap, right? So like, that's really important. Like you need to keep those up first. So like now scalding is down, but I kept my wall up. So it's worth it, right? Yeah. Anyway, you can see there, I actually did the early refresh of Boneyard before I, uh, let me go back a tiny bit more. So scalding is already down, right? But I have to blast bones here and I'm still on the front bar. Instead of going to do scalding back bar, I did boneyard because that's a more powerful dot. And then I'll do scalding because it's a less powerful dot. So basically what I'm trying to say is the keys to success with the dot build is making the right decisions in the moment. It definitely takes practice, but if you can keep the golden rule of like dot priority, it makes it much easier. Cause you'll be like, okay, I know that boneyard is stronger than scalding. So therefore I will always cast boneyard first, unless it's like, I don't know, seven seconds versus one second. Anyway, continuing on. I just keep reapplying all the dots as much as possible. Like, yes, they'll fall off occasionally. That's okay. You just keep going. Trap is, um, oh, by the way, for trap priority, trap is a little more important in my opinion than like scalding or degen. I, I know I just flipped those, but you know what I mean? So you wanna keep force up as much as possible too. All right, let's skip ahead. So, oh, wait, actually real quick. So as you can see, I'm dropping Meteor here, but at the beginning I dropped Destro. So you're probably thinking, why not just drop Destro the whole time? Well, there's a very specific reason for this. So Destro does more DPS in an off-balance window. If you look at the dummy's head right there, it has that little like swirling effect on its head. That means the target's off-balance. So Destro is doing more damage in these off-balance windows. But Meteor, on the other hand, does more damage outside of an off-balance window. So let's see when I get a Meteor. Now let's skip ahead a bit more. Yeah, okay, so Meteor's about to come up here in a little bit. The target is likely not off balance. So I meteor here. Yeah, the target's not off balance. There's no circle above its head because off balance windows only come on a certain cooldown. And this is all very advanced, but basically what I'm trying to say is Destro at the beginning and then meteor throughout the fight. Like you keep meteoring. I do the meteor here. I'll do another meteor here in a second. Yeah, meteor's about to come out here. So I do another meteor here. Although technically speaking, Destro would be stronger here, but I'm not going to save for it. Uh, cause it is off balance, but yeah, you do meteor here. So you start the fight with a Destro, more meteors. Now here's the, the juicy part is execute, which is what I think someone had a question about. All right. So basically, as I said, just keep all your dots up, like as you normally would going into execute, you're just still refreshing dots, still using two skill blast bones, but instead of doing a meteor, cause I'm going to get meteor, like, as you can tell, I'm only like 15 alt from a meteor. I'm going to have meteor, but I'm not going to use it. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to save for a destruction ultimate in uh in execute because it will do more damage in an off balance window so yeah in execute the first 25 percent like as you guys can clearly see i'm doing the same stuff i'm just refreshing my dots as usual blah 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 blah. here i have a destro ult. so this this is where things get a bit more advanced but if you really want to maximize your damage this is what you do if i look at my timer right there i see it's two minutes 54 seconds 0.8 um, i know that my parse is consistently in the 103 to 105k range so that i will always pretty much push the dummy into the off balance window at this timestamp. At 255, it's gonna hit an off balance window at 257. So I drop the Destro at 255. I'm about to, I mean. So yeah, like right here it's in an off balance window at 257. So you hold the Destro until you see the dummy is about to have that little circle on its head and you do Destro and execute one more time. If you look at my DPS, like right there, it's 102.3. It is about to skyrocket from that Destro ulti. 
Yep, we're already in 103, almost 104, 105. Like, yeah, Destro does a lot of damage. So this is where your question really gets answered about execute. We have 4% left. So in the skull build, right, it's pretty simple. You would just blast bones and skull and keep wall up until it dies because it's only a mill, so it's going to die real fast. But what would you do in a dot build rotation? Well, you would just click, you would find something to spam. So basically, this is where, if I had dead siphon here, by the way, this is where dead siphon would be so good. I'm clicking um, entropy here because I'm deciding, like, my crit is on my front bar, right? On the, on the front bar, I have 98% crit. On the back bar, I have, like, I think... I want to say like 60%, like 65% crit, or no, 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 sorry, like 85% crit, which is like not bad, but it's still lower. Um, so I want to stay on front bar so my dots can tick, because like I have all my dots of ticking. It's better for me to stay on the front bar and let them tick at 100%. And I'm spamming degen because it gives me empower. So I'm going to have 100% empower up the time there. But if I had detonating siphon for this parse instead, what I would have done instead of that is I would have just spammed Deadening Siphon and it would have died even faster because I would keep blowing it up. Now, let's say you wanted to do something a little more advanced. I'm just going to show you I'm a dummy because I don't have it in this video. I didn't do it. Um, let's say you wanted to speed up uh, execute a little early. Let me change windows. Stop streaming this. Stream all scrolls. All right. So let's say you wanted to... Let's pretend this 3 mil dummy is at, like, I don't know. Mm, let's say 8%. So it's almost dead. Now... If it's 8%, right, I'm just going to pull my dots out. If it's 8%, you don't want to, like, do every dot because it's already going to die, right? So, like, what would you do? Well, you would basically do this. You would do Blast Bones, Wall, because Wall is spamble, Scalding Rune, Blast Bones, Debt Siphon, Wall, Blast Bones, Scalding Rune, Debt Siphon. So, you basically, all the dots that don't have impact damage, so Mystic Orb, Boneyard, Arcanist, Degen, none of those have impact damage. Wall has an exploding effect. Scalding has an impact damage effect when you cast it. Debt Siphon has an explosion effect. So basically all your explosion dots, quote unquote, use those three with Blast Bones until the target dies. And it will die um, from the impact damage. It's almost like getting spam balls in a dot rotation. Does that make sense? What, what percentage would you say to do that at? What percentage? I would say 8 to 10 is your optimal range to do that in. Because anything above that, like let's say it's 25%, that's a lot of health. Like that's still, a, this is a 3 mil, so it's not that much health. But on this thing, like or like a trial boss, like, like let's say you're fighting a Yolmacrin, a thing's 25% is like, I don't know, 40 million, I think? Something like that, which is a lot of health. So if, if it was like 25%, and I let Orb, if I let Orb and Arcanist and Boneyard and even like Degen fall off for 25%, that's a lot of damage I'm losing at that point. You want to keep, it's basically like, so for 25, going into 25%, the only thing that changes, like let's say if you're on full Parse Crow, actually, I have a really better, I have a better idea. I have a video of me doing a Golem Parse, hold on, from yesterday. <laughs> what about Fograven? 8%, you're like, yeah, uh, 8 it's is like a little like 25 exactly. plus mil, like. Yeah, okay, let me change Windows one more time. You get there even at like, 2% on Falgraven. You're like, wait, do okay. I stop using spam spam alerts? What do I do? 8% Falgraven? Yeah, it's uh it's a lot. So let me show you. Okay. Let's see. So this is not like my best Yolm parts or anything, it's just from yesterday in my GS prog. So let's see. Alright. Uh, let's get to execute. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's get to execute. So here we are in Execute on Yolm. I don't have Hodor's on, so you can't see my DPS really, but um, anyway. So let's see. So here in Execute, I realize that the target is low. And what I start doing, as you can see, is I do Wall, I do Scalding, I do Blast Bones, I do Dead Siphon, right? Like, so, oh, I died from fucking Dragon Scorch here too, which is really funny. Uh, let me go, let me go back. That was pretty short. So let's see. Let's go to 25%. All right, so the dragon, dragon's about to land. So all of my dots are on the ground, right? Like here, I'm doing everything. Like as you can see, I'm doing every dot, including scalding, everything, and degen, all that stuff. So here's me using all my dots, um, just keeping them all up. But like as you can see, the dragon is getting pushed really fast. We have like six crows in our group, so like it doesn't take that long to execute. Like a dummy might take a little longer. So I, I finally, I re okay, my orb didn't go off there because the game hates me. But everything is supposed to like keep going for a little bit. I'm like, okay, now there's like 5% left. It's time to do just the spam balls. So I do Dead Siphon, Blast Bones, Wall, Scalding, Dead Siphon, Blast Bones. Like, 
you're basically just using your spammable dots at that point because at that point it's gonna die so fast like here it makes no sense to refresh mystic orb it makes no sense to refresh skull to arcanist right so it's like when you like really really want to execute it that's when you're using like wall or scalding or dead siphon with blast bones because it's gonna die so quick there's no point to letting it um in fact honestly i kind of misplayed here i probably should have started doing this around here maybe even here like i think eight percent like let's just let's just time how fast it takes to kill so that's like one let's look at the time stamps it's 418 i'm just gonna look when it dies Let's see, it dies, it takes, it takes roughly 15 seconds for it to die. So in 15 oh. seconds, only one of these dots can really go to full duration. So honestly, you could probably start at like, like I said, like 8% is probably a good estimate for when you can start doing the, the spamble dots, i.e. your dead siphon, i.e. your wall, i.e. your uh, scalding room, right? And then like a normal fight, like as you can see, I had like 80, almost 83 on Yolm, like single. It's execute is less impactful in like these fights because it's so short compared to like the uh, dummy. Like you do first seventy five percent matters more. So execute damage roto like it matters, but it's a pretty small optimization. But like yeah, basically eight percent is a good rule of thumb for when you start doing your spamble dots, your dead siphons, your scaldings, your um, unstable walls. Okay, so are there any questions on like rotation for for dummy? I mean like. So the, the ulti order should be um, elemental two, uh, what is it called? Comets? Oh, right. Your, your ult and order, if, if you're a full parse crow, is Destro ult to start. You do meteor up until um, roughly like 30-ish percent. That's been, like, it's, it's, it's pretty intuitive. Like, you'll see. Like, it also, it, okay, here's the thing. It also depends on your damage, right? Like, if you're pushing the dummy like super fast, you're only going to get like four ultis off, but if you're pushing it a little slower, like let's say you're hitting 85k on the dummy, you might get an extra meteor in or something. But in general, the way to do it is just Destro at the start, meteor throughout the fight. When you get toward, yeah, like you just saw Vortex drop a meteor there. He's about to be, right here he's at 45%, so he's still going to meteor one more time. But the next time he, um, once he gets to like 30%, he's going to save for a Destro ultimate. So you just save a Destro ultimate for execute basically, like... If you get a meteor at 28%, don't use it. Wait until you have Destro ulti. Wait for the off balance window. Then use it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, because I find myself doing the Destro, the meteor, the meteor, and then I don't have enough at the end for another uh, Destro ult. So you do that Destro, mean I meteor, just meteor, and you don't have enough? That yeah. can't be true. I think I might just be letting my ulti build up. And not yes, that's, that's a common probably. issue. So it's really important to um, use meteor as soon as you have it it's really important to do that okay yeah so just make sure you're using your meteors on cooldown and make sure that you're getting a dust at the end um any other questions for like rotation slash like dot priority that kind of thing um i have a question about the dummy specifically is the off balance window is just like time based so like as you're starting the fight once you start it'll start immediately and then just on and off yes so it's time based it's, it's okay. not health based so um at the start, there's always going to be a off balance window, which is why we open with a death strip. Like if I just do this, so I can boom, share my off balance. Real quick. Like as as yeah. you can see, it's off balance yeah. right there, right? So at the start, it always gets the instant off balance proc. As the fight progresses, like if I just if I theoretically kept light attacking this forever, it would still keep getting off balance windows. Um, if if you look at my screen, I'm I'm actually tracking it. So if you want to like see how it actually like would work on a dummy it like has periods of like off balance and then like off balance immunity yeah so, like if you look like above my hodors like it starts off with like six second i think it's six or seven second uh like windows of off balance and 14 seconds of off balance immunity okay. and then like off balance pretty much procs like immediately like on that dummy so you can like track that stuff through like standards if you yeah. want so that's but really like, helpful too. It's like a really good time. Like you see, like off balance comes back up on the dummy. You have to actually be doing damage for it to keep procking. So that's why it procked as soon as I attacked. But if you saw, like if I kept the rotation going, you want to time your ultis with off balance, right? Uh, just I mean, Destro. I'm just I mean, technically kind of speaking, wasting time. technically I mean, speaking, like obviously, like meteor is. So like. like then off balance will tick immediately and it's a six second window and you can fit in heavy attacks if you need to sustain yeah 
But oh, for heavy attacks, you pretty much never need a heavy attack on a crow. Um, even in like trials, yeah. it's pretty rare. So yeah, on a crow. It's let's go over some. It's more you can you can time your damage with it though for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So yes, off balance is optimal for timing damage with because of our explorer passive. So, oops. Yeah, if we look at the explorer passive, ten percent more damage. Um, to targets that are off balance. So like, yeah, yeah, optimally, like you want to time your ults in the off balance window, but like, you're not really always gonna do that. Especially with like Meteor, you might not always do that. So like, it's okay. Like Meteor will do, you basically just, it's not super advanced. You really just death at the start, Meteor throughout the fight, and death at the end, slash and execute. Pretty simple stuff. Okay, let's see. What else am I missing? Slash need to go over. Um, okay, let's talk about the skull build a little bit like in vcr and in fast so this is like a setup i would use in most mini trials let me just do this instead make sure it's correct yeah so this would work um i would replace i don't really use two piece crit anymore i was trying it out in this like one time but in general i would use perfected false god medusa and maw that would be my setup for vast and vcr um Let's see, let me leave group real quick so I can be out of combat and change something up. So, for Vast, because I know everyone here really loves Vast, it's like one of our most popular trials in the guild. What you want to do is you want to have Camel Hunter. Now, what I should change in this build, um, because I don't know why it's like this because I never use this anymore, but I would, instead of Boneyard Front Bar, I would do this. I would do Inner Light with the Camel Hunter and then do. Grave Lord back where we have Avid Boneyard Overstructure. So with this modified build, this is like our vast build. Like as you can see, we went from having like seven dots to only having Debt Siphon, Boneyard, Wall, Orb, and uh, Skull Targus. So we basically we went from seven dots to five. So in a vast window, when Olms is protected, you have, or, or I should say, after a protector, you have about I think it's 16, 14 to 16 seconds to do damage to Olms. So what does that really entail? Well, what that means is, let's say this target Bone Goliath is Olms. What I would do is, okay, the Protector is just dead, right? I would start with Blast Bones. I would cast every dot. I still do Skull Blast Bones, by the way. So you have every dot up. Now that every dot up is up, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to stay Front Bar, Skull, Blast Bones, Skull. Even if other stuff falls off, I'm just going to keep Skulling and Blast Boning. And the reason why is the dots all have a duration of about 10 or so seconds, right? Like this to last 10 seconds this last 10 seconds this last 10 seconds i'm not going to refresh those because at 10 seconds one even they, wall you can refresh wall it's not the worst okay so so wall is a little or bit just like the light attack damage you're losing yeah you can you can do wall if you want to um honestly i don't always do it though like to be honest it's a pretty small difference when you like in vasp um cause at the very end of the protector phase you only have like three or four spambles so yeah you'll lose light attack damage for a little bit but the skull, okay, so like one skull hit is more DPS than like four ticks of wall, right? So like it's, that's a big difference. Like just, just one skull is more DPS than like four ticks of wall. So obviously three skulls is like a lot better, basically. Um, and yeah, you could, you can do wall though, because wall has that spammable effect, right? If you were going to do that, Kaz, what I would do is, let's say, you know, it's been like, I don't know. Like recast it early. Yeah, a little, so a little early. Yeah, you can do it a little early because then it's, yeah. Yeah, basically, like, yeah. Other dots, though, you would really definitely not recast. And the reason why is dots should only be recast if you get their full duration out of it. So, like, in Vass, you just reapply all your dots one time to Alms. Then from there on, yeah, you could do wall early one time. But in general, you would just do skull blast bones the whole way through. So, how about for CR? What would a CR build look like? Well, this is also an important trick, by the way. So I would use Structure Entropy because, for one thing, you take a lot of, like, extra damage in CR. Um, mm -hmm. It's, like, really annoying with, like, you know, all the dot dark drains and all those, like, extra dots. So Entropy is nice because it will help heal you a little bit. It's not a super strong heal, but it's better than, like, Scalding Rune because Scalding is just pure damage. It doesn't do any healing for you. Uh, entropy actually heals you. So why is Entropy on the front bar and why is Gravel on the back bar for my CR build? Like, let's just say this is my Cloud Rest build. Um... Well, the reason why is because any single target dot, and this isn't just for Necro, guys. This is for any single target dot. It's so like for DK, like your claws slash like breath. Any single target dot that you place on a target only scales with the front bar or with the, with the stats of the bar you cast it on. 
So what does that mean? Well, your back bar, like your maelstrom bar, has weaker stats than your front bar. Like if I look at my character right now, these are my stats on the front bar. These are my stats in the back bar. You can see I have a hundred less spell damage. I have less crit. I have everything is worse, right? On the front bar, on the back bar. I mean. So an AOE dot like Boneyard, if I cast it on the back bar to this dummy, and then switch to front bar, it's now it's the game is now reading my stats from the front bar and applying it to that Boneyard, even though I cast it on the back bar. But with Dgen, since it's not an AOE ability, it's a single target. If I ca let's pretend I just let's pretend this is my back bar. If I cast it on the back bar and then went to the front bar, it would still be reading the stats from the back bar. So if a Dgen damage is lower on the if you cast it from back bar to front bar. So in this instance, like in a cloud rest build, where if you want entropy on your, in your build, you need to have it on the front bar or you're losing damage. Basically, you just move Boneyard to the back. The, the crit chance will still be 98% in execute because you'll have a ricochet skull. In fact, actually, with PFG, it's going to be 100% because you'll have 72% base crit, and you have three abilities. So what does a, a Cloud Rush rotation look like? Well, kind of like um, Vass, Zamaja has uh, phases on her tail, and she's going to port, right? The thing is, um, there's no protection phase for Zamaja. She's like sl she's slinking underground, so you know where she's going to move to because you know that little pool on the ground where she's like going to be. So you prelay all your dots while you're in transition. Like if I'm running to the tail, this is where it looks like. I'm like, oh, there she is. I'm going to put all my dots down. Then I get there, start doing damage. I'm using skull. I'm staying on the front part as long as possible. I don't have to bar swap because my dots are already on the ground. But what if dots run out? Well, if Zamaja does not do crushing darkness or does not raise her hand, and crushing darkness, by the way, you see her raise her hands up and like she's like channeling something as like a tether coming from her head to the ground. That means she's going to refresh her ability to stay for 12 seconds. So in that instance, if she moves her head up, you want to refresh your dots. So like, oh, I just saw Zamasha put her hands up and she's channeling char um, crushing. I'm going to put my dots down once more. But let's say she doesn't do that. It's like a short tail. I'm like, oh, she didn't do it. I know she's not going to be here for long. If my dots fall off, I'm going to let them fall off. I'm just going to spam skull. So basically, the trick to in-raid parsing is to know when should I reapply dots and when should I just spam, right? Same goes for the dot build, actually. Let's go back to Yon. Let's see. Oh, 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 wait. I have a big tip. If if you're ever doing mechanics, like, it's nice to have your refresh your dots and then go do your mechanics, you know, right? Yes. Because you're losing exactly. damage. Or yes. resing. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, if you're in cloud rest and, like, let's say there's a creeper, like, let's pretend this is the creeper and that's Zamaja, I would be like, oh, shit. Okay, I have to go kill it. Like, let's say, imagine he's like, all right, everyone focus creeper. I'd be like, okay, let me just put on my dots real quick on Zamaja, and then boom, let go hit the creeper with this. Because all my dots are going to be taking on the boss while I hit the creeper doing this, right? So yeah, like Vortex said, anytime you're doing mechanics, really good to just um, put your dots on whatever the priority target is, like slash, or like the boss, and then go hit the thing that you need to hit with skulls. That's also why I used like the skull build in like CR or Vass. Like if you need to hit something that's like not dotted up, Skull's really good for that, right? Like, let's say, like, oh, focus films from, like, whatever range. I'd be like, oh, hi, films. <laughs> let me go throw some skulls at you. Or, like, hit that protector. Let me throw some skulls at you. Like, it's just really nice to have a skull for that instance. Also, another thing that's important, this is why I would not just neglect the skull build entirely. Next patch, there is a chance that the skull build could outperform a dot build because we're getting a monster helm that increases flame damage by 5%. And, I mean, as you can see, skull is flame damage. So maybe that 5% will increase skull to the point where it beats the dot build. And also, Necro should be insane next patch because of flame damage from Blast Bones. All that stuff will basically add up to make it even further ahead of other classes. So, like, now is the time, brethren, to learn. Because Crow is already ahead of other classes this patch by so much. Next class, it's gonna, the next patch is just going to be even more ahead. Because we're getting more flame damage. We're getting a universal crit nerf. When there's a universal crit nerf, Crow just becomes even better because we over crit and execute. And so we gain less of a nerf than other classes would when there's a crit nerf, if that makes sense, because our crit is naturally higher, theirs is lower, so it's like GG. Um, so that's what, what I've been meant by my crit like? get him buff. Yeah, basically. Like, how, how much crit are we losing for other classes? We are losing, I think, somewhere between 5 to 10% crit. It depends on what CPU slot, but... It's a lot. That's it's a lot. lot of crit. It's a lot of crit. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot, actually. It is a lot of crit. Two-piece crit might be stronger next patch. Than a lot of setups. Um, be a crow. Like let's say let's say base crit with the Sororia setup, or even just let's just say this false guy setup. Right, we have like seventy eight percent crit right now. That could lower to like sixty eight percent. 
well for like a night blade that really fucking sucks man because your crit damage that you get on crits is going to be lower because you have 68 percent let's say if i'm a crow and i have 68 percent crit yeah i mean obviously it's a nerf to my crit too for the first 75 percent but for the last 75 percent i'll still have 100 percent crit and my crit is going to be like it's basically going to average out to give me an extra 10 percent crit back so instead of like let's say with the false god build you have like over 80 percent effective crit when you factor and execute when it's nerfed i'll have like 70 percent effective crit which is almost like the crit i have now versus a knight but they only has 60 like that's a big difference right so like it just gets worse and worse for other classes but it's like not a huge loss for crow basically it's still a loss of course but it's just not as bad um the other thing is that flame damage helmet it's going to increase all da flame damage the target takes by five percent well our strongest ability is blast bones and it does flame damage so blast bones like as we noted once more pulling up this parse did 20k dps if we take five percent of that like that is a lot of extra damage just for free so like it would go from doing 20,049 dps to i believe that is 21,000 it's like yeah i mean it's not like an insane difference but this is like a free 1k Plus, all our light attacks get an increase, uh, Boneyard, and if we have Skull, we get an increase. Like, Crow could gain damage that other classes won't gain as much. Like, obviously, DK could be really good next patch, too, because, like, they have so much flame damage. But, yeah, they, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, let me open up the board a little bit. Is there any other questions about, like, dummy parsing, stuff like that? Except it is with a TLDR. If you do this, your damage will go up as a Crow, just in general. Like, maybe you're not perfect, but if you do this, boom. Sure. Bang. So uh, the main thing I can recommend, and this is what Clive told me, is cast more walls. <laughs> so if you're doing the dot build, right, the most important thing, what the hell? Oh, that's why. If you're doing the dot build, um, pretty much the easiest way to gain free damage is like, hey, let me just do this real quick. Okay, so 10,000 is to it will work for our purposes. All right, so I'm just getting all my dots up. I'm gonna work on that last one to go too quick. All right, so like right here, wall right like it's just as much as you possibly can like you want to recast the spam with us like the other ones are kind of going down i'm recasting my spam wolf. that will give you more damage like, as you can see I, i'm able to keep up all the other dots and just bam wall like four seconds left why not wall <laughs> like it's just the more walls you can cast or like the more scaldings the more walls the more dead siphons you can get in a parse the more damage you're just going to indirectly get because those are all like three little spam bolts and it still helps your rotation because you're just overcasting dots. So it's like, oh, look, like my wall is like forever up because I'm always casting it like four seconds early. And if you did that like on a night blade, people would look at you and be like, you're an idiot. You're losing so many spam balls <laughs> because you're doing the wall four seconds early. That's like four early weapons you could have done, bro. It's like, yeah, but on crow, I can just spam wall because it's my spammable. So like if I've ever like need to recast dots i pretty much always do wall first because like why not it's just like it's free damage basically that that's a tldr thing the other thing is like all other classes the most you'll get out of your damage is when you increase these two numbers or these three numbers your light attack to i, I also i really pay get this part so you can see i missed eight light attacks it's pretty bad but like anyway the more the most damage you can gain on any class in crow is no different is improving your foundation so your foundation is your ratio of light attacks to skills and your time lost. So Seven it, seconds, holy shit. Yeah, yeah. I so was like, like full. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like that's like what makes an 106k plus pars possible is you practice it so much that you lose less time. Um, you speed up your weaving average, you get your light attack, you get your foundations. The more you can improve rotation speed, light attack consistency and weaving average the more damage you will get on this class just like any other class so all i can really say for tldr most obvious direct thing you can do to increase damage is cast as many siphons cast as many walls and cast as many scaldings as you can overcast because they are all impact damage so that will 40 percent blast ones crit what the fuck anyway um yeah you'll get more out of those because they are they are spambles and dots at the same time so if you can increase your ability to recast those early that will give you more damage but the real tldr is get good basically just get real good at the weaving average get real good at lose at time loss just practice every day i mean i don't 
I don't actually parse on Badumi that much anymore. Like, it's pretty rare that I'll even do it once per day. But ba when I was first starting out on Magpro, like, okay, so let me just give you a little background. When I, f I used to play Magden more, like, really early on. But then I was, like, told, like, oh, Magden is kind of bad. You should play Magpro instead. And I was like, it helps with the group more. I was like, okay. So I first parsed, I was hitting, like, zero damage. And I was like, what the hell is this class? I could have just quit there and been like, fuck Necro. Because a lot of people have, like, a fuck Necro mentality. Like, oh, the skills are weird and buggy. Like, it sucks. But now... I have the most fun when I play Necro, even compared to like Nightblade and stuff, I think Necro is more fun because it's really challenging. Like seven dots is a lot to keep up. In my opinion, right now, it's one of the harder classes to play because it, I mean, the skill gap between a really cracked crow like Clive or like Bread or like your average player is really big. Like most people are not going to hit 105k plus. It's pretty rare. So, like, it's really rewarding to be able to push your damage this high. Like, a lot of Storks, I, I noticed the floor and the ceiling is a little, like, lower, if that makes sense. Like, it's not that hard to hit 100k on a story. I, I hope it don't sound obvious when I'm saying this, by the way. I'm talking from, like, a really high end game perspective. But, like, in a really high end game environment, it's not that difficult for your, your really good player to just pick up Stork and hit 100k. But it isn't that easy to just pick up Crow and hit 100k. It, it takes some time and practice. Like, Vortex can probably tell you as playing both classes. Like, it probably took a bit more time to learn yeah. Crow, right? Yeah. Yeah, the dot build is like, and doesn't even compare, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, 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 yeah, it just takes more. The Sork? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just a lot different, like, to learn. So, like, it's really rewarding to invest your time into Necro. But all I can really say is, I used to suck at it. I practiced on the dummy a ton. I practiced in raids a lot. And eventually you'll get it. Like, there, to be honest, there's. <laughs> There's no substitute for practice, like, of course. He used to be a, a floor lord. You I did used to be a floor lord. It's true. It's true. All these are true. Oh, but yeah, gosh. basically, it's just the more you can practice on the dummy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's <laughs> actually interesting <laughs> I'm because, lucky. like, Magden has kind of a similar rotation. We're mm -hmm, doing, does. uh, like, Deep Fisher every two skills, so transitioning to Crow is actually not as different from other classes maybe yeah that makes sense because yeah fisher is like but like for me like i worked really really hard to get my magnet like perfected and then yeah. i switched to crow and it's like it's actually a lot different but then i'm still hitting harder anyway so yeah i mean bad. crow is very cracked this patch it is in my opinion without a doubt the best class you can play right now if you really want to play meta so yeah um like even when i what's up you cut out. All right, I disconnected. People can hear me, right? Oh. Hello.
I was curious about dead water. There oh we yeah. Go. Jeez. Just well, it's gonna be dead. It's gonna be dead dead water. So yeah, like is like, it? Wait, so dead yeah. water is getting buffed? Uh, no, it's getting oh, destroyed. Yeah. When? So there's no point. In dead water. Yeah, next what? patch it's dead. Yeah. Wait, wait, they already said that. You don't have to kill these ads to go up. Okay, really? so yeah. um, just to conclude this, I want to talk about a couple of like the buff sets and like what you can do to uh, wear those because I was kind of talking just from a full parse perspective. So let's see. I think I have an EC setup somewhere here. Yeah. All right. So um, for EC, am I streaming still? No, I'm not. One second. If you want to uh, go over trash setups at some point too, Camel. Yeah, I'll do all that stuff. Um, yeah. So first, we'll talk about yeah. We'll talk about the buff sets first. So, yep. Catalyst. Um, this is probably the most well known. What the hell is this setup? One second. Do I even have an EC setup anymore? <laughs> This is how you know I haven't been in ECG in a little bit. Um, let's see. I'll just put one together real quick. Oh, okay. Anyway, it's so like, yeah, as you can see, I've been removed from jail from that message from Crazy Cans. But anyway, um, yeah, so if you're doing EC, so Catalyst. Catalyst is probably the most well known. Of like the necro buff sets and for like for good reason uh it's the easiest to keep up with necros um default passives so anyway if you don't know what catalyst does but you probably do but i'll still go over it anyway so whenever you do flame shock or frost damage you apply a stack of flame shock or frost weakness which by the way it can have all three of these at the same time up so basically like all these are separate buffs but like they're at the same time on the same target you increase their uh critical damage taken by three percent so when I do flame damage, boom, flame, boom, frost, shock, it increases the damage um, by 9%. So this target dummy right now is taking 9% more crit damage for my entire group. That is a, quite a lot. That is really, really, really strong. Um, so what would you do instead? So to proc this, Necro obviously has some pretty good advantages. It has flame damage from Blast Bones. It has frost damage from Avid Boneyard. And it has shock damage from mystic siphon now you might be thinking wait camel you have dead siphon how are you going to proc it and you might be thinking wait the arcanist does shock damage too well arcanist doesn't actually count because it's technically a pet so it doesn't apply ec shock for you i know that's really weird but that's what it is so how do you get shock damage well even if i had mystic siphon that's a very unreliable way to proc shock damage and the reason why is because a siphon is a little buggy in raid and sometimes it just won't hit the right target and b it's not going to be available to cast. So, like, let's say we're starting a fight, and this is a really, really, really sweaty Scorpus team. If I cast my normal rotation and I do Blast Bones, wait, wait for it to pop off, get my Boneyard. As you can see, I did Blast Bones, Boneyard, so I have Frost, and I have Flame. But I don't have Siphon yet. Only now, after a second Blast Bones, can I proc Siphon. And that was at least two seconds of not having Shock. You might be thinking, really two seconds does that shit even matter well yeah it does matter and the other thing is it's kind of difficult to always proc it like let's say it's zamaja and she moves i have to wait for my blast bones every single time to hit her first before i can proc mystic siphon if i'm using mystic siphon that is to get uh shock because i'm a target and that ends up being two seconds every tail and if there's like t you know more than 10 tails per fight well then, yeah, we just lost over 20 seconds of shock weakness, and now it's a big deal. So how do you mitigate that factor? You put a shock enchant on your front bar. So whatever you're using, like let's say it's a staff of catalyst, it doesn't have to be though. It could be a PFG staff. You could have catalyst in the body. It doesn't matter. Up times are basically the same on front bar or back bar, like to be honest. So it doesn't really matter. But either way, you're putting a shock damage clip. That way, it's, with the same rotation I just showed. If I do light attack blast bones, boneyard, boom. It already has the shock on it because my shock enchant is proccing the weakness. My blast bones hit. So every light attack is not only proccing flame from the flame staff's light attacks, it's also proccing shock. So I'm getting two at once. And my boneyard is proccing the frost. Easy clap. So really, other than that, for catalyst, nothing special to know. You just do your normal rotation and you will apply catalyst. So if the more cracked you are as a crow, the more damage you're doing, the more catalyst you'll get because you're going to have more uptime and everything. So just do your normal rotation. Catalyst is nothing special that way. But there is one other set that, well, actually a couple of sets that crow uses uh, that buff. So the first one is MK. So I am in, in my god slayer. I am in MK jail for Loki and Nami. So first of all, uh, what's question about the EC? Yeah, sure. Would something like Force Pulse 
proc all three instantly off cast? It does. Or? It does. So force okay. pulse is definitely nice to use, but so why wouldn't you use force pulse? Well, you totally can. There's nothing wrong with force pulse, but as you can see, I don't even have it unlocked right now. That's how little I use it. The reason being is if you have to pick between ricochet skull and force pulse, you should almost always go force pulse. And here's the reason why. So force pulse can have similar, if maybe a little higher cleave than skull. Just maybe a, a tiny bit better cleave, i.e. hitting multiple targets it might be a little better for that. But Skull is much better for single target. It is significantly stronger than Force Pulse on one target. Um, so in most high-end groups, you're trying to push single target damage the, as much as you can. So you wouldn't really want to run false Force Pulse because you want Skull to get more single target on the boss. Because, I mean, generally in high-end groups and even like medium-end groups, the faster a boss dies, the better it is for everybody, obviously, because you don't want to do more, more mechanics, right? Like... Optimizing right. damage on some trash and stuff that already gets instant nuked by like black like most of your cleave is gonna come naturally from blast bones, wall, orb, and boneyard, and even arcanist to some degree. So optimizing your spam bowl for cleave is kinda like unnecessary because you already have so much cleave from blast bones, boneyard, wall, and orb and arcanist that and the extra 1k cleave that force pulse has is definitely offset by the extra two to three k DPS single target that skull brings. You know what I mean? So it's like it's better to use. You don't it's need just better to pulse. use like the double damage staff then. Yeah, exactly. It's better to use the shock enchant um, than the force pulse. The other thing is, you have to remember this too. On a crow, even when I have skull on, if I'm doing something like this, like I'm doing all my dots. Just pretend it's Mr. World real quick. Like as you can see, when do I get to cast skull? It's pretty rare, right? Like it takes a while. Like I, here we go. I'm about to have a skull window right now. I get one skull off. Mystagor, you get another skull off, like maybe like two skulls off. It takes a while to get skulls, like as you can see. Like it takes me a while to get skulls in a natural rotation. I have windows where I can use like one or two, but it's pretty rare. So let's say we did your setup and we used a flame enchant instead of, and we were like, oh, I'll use force pulse to proc them reliably. I mean, you can do it, it's not the worst thing. It's just that Crow doesn't get to do spam walls as much as their classes. So force pulse, you're not gonna be able to use it as much. So if you rely on it, it's not that great, and you're gonna get more shock enchant or shock uptime with the shock enchant than you would with force pulse, and you get the benefit of running skull. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions about EC? It's pretty straightforward, but I'm I'm not um, talking about anything. Does it matter if you have uh, as far as gear setup for EC if it's like full body versus jewelry wet, or does it? Really or yeah. Texas mini boss. Uh, basically, Thanks. it does not really matter. Um, the reason why is this. So EC, let's look at the thing. Oh, I took it off. But we'll just look at the set bonus real quick. So if we look at Catalyst. Um, Goodbye. So it lasts for three seconds. Because of the nature of our rotation, we're never going to be on the back bar for more than three seconds, right? So like if I'm doing Blast Bones, I'm only going to do two skills. That's only two seconds, and then I'm back on the front bar. So EC can never run out if you're doing the rotation the correct way. Um, and you'll always reapply it. Even if I put dots on the back bar, swap to front bar, the catalyst will proc because those back bar dots are coming out instantly on my front bar doing that damage, right? So I've, I've tested it with both. And the answer is there is basically zero difference between uptimes. I, it's, it's hard to compare pull to pull in a raid because I mean, there's so many variables, but like in general, I did not notice a noticeable difference in um, uptimes between front bar and body. No. So in general though, if you're like, not so confident about always getting back on front bar in two seconds you can just put it on the body and it will just make it a lot easier so optimally it's on the body technically speaking but if you have to run it on the front bar for whatever reason not a big deal basically is what i'm gonna say oh and then, yeah would you always run a shot glyph for if you're ec yeah you should always run a shot bar. glyph okay so zarkus asks about brittle asylum staff single target single frost staff or double frost staffs so Zarkus, I actually had a similar idea to you one time, and I was like, ooh, what if I used the Asylum Frost Staff to proc Brittle? Well, like I was just answering in the previous question, you don't get that many spammable windows on a Necro. So the problem with that is, with the Asylum Staff, it takes two direct casts to apply the guaranteed Brittle proc, and you're not going to get it that often. The other thing is with the Asylum Staff, we have to use a two-piece on our front bar, so we've compromised the rest of our builds somewhat, now we have to use like willpower or drop a monster helm if we want two five sets. It's basically just not worth it because you won't. I, I honestly tested it one time with just double ice, no asylum versus ice, uh, flame back bar with asylum front bar, and honestly double ice had better uptime. 
I don't really think Asylum Ice is worth it on a Crow because you don't get to do spamables that often. Um, as far as Brittle in general, so what you would do for a Brittle setup, you would have a charged Ice Staff. Let me see if I have it on my character. Yeah, so you'd have a charged Ice Staff on the front bar with the Shock Damage Glyph, like let's say you're doing EC Brittle. Um, you'd have the Ice front bar with Charged. And nowadays, post fixing crashes, you can do a Maelstrom Ice and it won't really crash people. But you also, if you want more damage for yourself with a very, very small loss to Brittle of Time, you can do Maelstrom Perfected Inferno. And on the back bar, you would have a Frost Glyph. The Frost Glyph will proc on your wall cooldown. And it actually is the best way to proc uh, Brittle. If you're using an Ice back bar, you would still do the Frost Enchant back bar. It's going to be, and it has to be infused by the way, just uh, FYI. So you would use a, either Frost or Flame back bar with an infused Frost Glyph on the back bar. And you would use a Charged, which applies status effects by 220% increased chance. A Charged front bar with a Shock Enchant if you're doing EC. Any other questions for EC? I, su I suppose I should talk about what you would want to pair with it too. So if you're using EC, in general, the most consistent option is going to be Medusa EC or Mother Sorrow EC. So you would drop Minor Slayer. You wouldn't have Sororia or Perfected False God. Oh, and never use False God EC. That That is so low damage. Mother Sorrow and Medusa are much stronger than False God for uh, for EC. And also, just pro tip in general, False God, not super needed for Crow in most situations. I, I really only use it for Cloud Rest and AS just because it's a convenience thing. But even Cloud Rest, if I'm up top, I'm going Sororia 100%. Like, if I'm just parsing up top and I'm not going down the portal... Sororia is for sure better. You can basically, I mean, sustain is so cracked on a Necro that you really don't need False God in most instances. But anyway, False God is really low damage by itself. If you do False God with EC, your damage will suffer way too much. So you should do either Medusa or Mother Sorrow with EC. And the other option is Sororia EC with two-piece crit. But I will warn you that two-piece crit Sororia setup with EC is going to be less consistent than Mother Sorrow with Medusa. And like Maul, like if you just use Maul, you also get that damage from the monster helm it's it's very close either way sororia can have higher parses if you get lucky with crit but if you get unlucky with crit you're gonna parse a lot lower so in general i would just recommend doing medusa ec or mother sorrow ec any other questions about ec before i move on to mk no okay so this is an mk setup so let me pull out my mk setup so this is what i run in god slayer on locustus so as you can see i'm using mk with oh what's up ideal uptime for brittle should be yeah something around 60 percent of the time would be good um yeah that something it, it depends on the fight darkest like you have to really go into the logs like if you, if you got like 35 percent and like on sunspire or something you have to go look at the land phase like when the dragon's actually down because otherwise it's going to be hard to know what your actual brittle uptime was okay so let's go into mk real quick so mk same thing, as you can see I have Medusa with MK because, again, your crit would be pretty low with Sororia. Now, on Navi, I actually do do Sororia MK. The reason why is I can just sit there and parse and I run two-piece crits. So basically, either of these steps will work. You can do MK with Sororia or you can do MK with Medusa. Now, MK, on the other hand, it's off it can be on Crow. I personally think that MK on the Sork is the best option. Because they don't lose as much damage, and Sorcus is really easy to play with MK because you don't have as many dots to keep up, so Bash Raven is a little easier. But what you do for MK is, well, let's see, let me get into comments so I can see the tracker. As you can see, I have like a little tracker on the side next to my ulti. It tells you what your stand percentage is, like right under, you see the green zero, and now it says 39. It tells me that I'm at 39% stam. So MK procs when you're under 50% stam, and what it does is it makes the enemy take 8% more damage. Um, which is a lot. I mean, 8% damage is a lot. So you, it's something the group will ask for. Like in higher end groups, someone's going to be on MK almost always. And an MK Crow is a possibility. So it's pretty much always MK Crow or MK Sork. Or if not a DPS, it's on the healer usually. So how do you proc MK? Well, what you want to do is, let's say this is like, I don't know, <laughs> Locustus. What I would do is, I'm here with my group at the beginning of the fight. I would roll dodge twice. I mean, I'm already low on Sam, so I did it one time there. But you roll dodge twice and you hold block. Well, you, why you hold block is your stam won't regen, and your stam is already low to start the fight, right? So the Ray Blade's like, all right, counting, five, four, three. Oh, another tip, always do blast moves on three, three, two. You go in, boom, I have the MK proc already ready to go, and what you do from there is you see your normal rotation, 
and you just occasionally get spam. So as you can see here, I knew I was going to get low, and I do a bash. So it's a bash for you, you do light attack, skill, bash. All, almost all over. So it's like light attack, skill, bash. That lowers your stam, it keeps it low, as long as you light attack the target, you will apply MK. It's basically a learn skill, you just have to learn how to bash for you, but once you can do that, it's pretty simple. Um, all I want to say for MK is you don't need any special glyphs because you're not based on elemental damage, it's just your stamina being under 50%, and you just proc MK that way. Alright, any other questions for MK? Because like your other setup. No? Okay. Well, so like yeah, I, I did it on, I tried it on VKA hard mode the other day. Do you usually run that, have somebody run it during a uh, roll in Yandir? Uh, yeah, you can. So. For VK, that sucked ass. It, it definitely sucked because you, you have to block a lot. If I was doing VK, I would eat this food. I would eat sugar skulls because now you have 18k stam, and like your stam recovery. Yeah, okay. Gonna, yeah, yeah, exactly. It makes you it have more under 50 percent. Like you have yes. the same amount under 50 percent as you normally would anyway. Exactly. So it tries to have right. food anywhere that you have to like, okay, like for, <laughs> same thing for Naventos. I am a monkey, so I keep our Tam on, but I should do uh, try stat food because it makes it easier when you have to block like for Thrash or for like the Meteors and BKA, MK can yeah. get a little dicey. For sure it can get a little dicey. So you got to be careful. I would say in VKA, yeah, I would say for MK and for like uh, on Navi or like on like the roll on Yandere fights. I would try to hover around 50% as much as possible. Like, I would try to keep my stamp here. And, like, I would not over bash spam. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I would keep it, like, here. I know a proc's about to come out here a couple times. I'll just get it a little low. One more bash proc. Boom. You wouldn't want it to get, like, below 40. Like, some people just go, like, oh, I'm just going to be the, the brain dead MK and just constantly bash me. Like, you can see my stamp getting so low. And now I don't even have to bash me for, like, a little bit. I'm like, ha ha ha. I can just do my attacks. Easy mode. If you do yeah, this on Yandir, like, back. goodbye. Like, you're going to die for sure. So you got to be really careful with MK. It's definitely a skill set that requires, like, a different skill set than just EC. EC is just your regular damage setup. MK requires a bit more practice. Any questions on that? Okay. I think... Uh, do you, run, do you yeah. run that just front bar, or do you run, like, body pieces or something? I typically or front bar MK, MK but yeah, body that, that's what too. It works, too. They, they both work, for sure. Uh, I think so with, I a crit, with a crit set, like if I'm using Medusa MK, you do it front bar. But on my Navi setup, where I have Sororia MK with two-piece crit, you would do it on the body. And technically speaking, it's actually a little easier to keep it up when it's on the body because it can proc on both bars' yep. light attacks. But that's only because I want Sororia's proc on the front bar. Uh, otherwise, I would do front bar MK just because you, it's better than front bar Medusa or front bar Medusaro basically for your own DPS. And you have time is still gonna be good regardless. Any other questions? I, I think I ran it with false gods on Acton. One time. Yeah, I would never like do that. I, was in your proc. I would never do that. I don't think false god is ever really parable with a buff setup. You're just gonna have too low damage because it, it, it's significantly behind Mother Sorrow or Medusa. I can kind of see why you do that for Magnum just because you're sustaining. That's just the so sustain. Rough. Yeah, that's yeah. the only reason. But your damage would go down a lot. So that's why. That's also why people use it on Crow because the sustain's already good, so you don't need PFG. Stork can kind of do it. Like, their sustain's always kind of bad, but, like, I mean, not, like, as bad as other classes, at least. So, yeah. So, like, but, if you're saying you're usually using, like, the buff set, like, front bar, and then another damage set, like, whether it's Mother Sorrow, Medusa, whatever. But, like, what if you're running to, like, what if you're running, like, EC, MAEC okay. or something? Or yeah, so MAEC, um, you would do, you could do either front bar. I, I personally prefer Master Architect front bar. Um, but you could do either. The advantage of EC front bar with Master Architect is you get to slot Meteor on your front bar, so you have a bit more mag. But also, the one thing about EC is EC is not that bad of a damage set. Like, if we look at it, we get max mag, spell crit, max mag. Like, that's pretty decent. If we front bar EC, we lose the max mag um, one piece when we're on the back bar. Not a huge deal, but, like, yeah. Technically speaking, Master Architect's a little better to front bar. Um, yeah. So, let's see. Let's see, if you were in like Super Jail, like ECMK, I would not run the Shadow. Like, obviously, we've been running Shadow this whole time. I'd run the Thief with ECMK. That way, your crit's a little higher. You could technically do Shadow and pray for good RNG. But if you have ECMK, your crit's so low, you're probably going to do that. Now, ECMK, pretty rare setup on a DPS. Like, I, I've honestly never seen a top end score push group use ECMK 
on the same damage dealer because that's just like super jail. One thing that isn't that uncommon though is brittle EC. So you will see this a lot, especially in like a God Slayer group. You'll see someone running a front bar ice staff with a, sometimes, usually a back bar flame, but it can be both ice staffs if they really want to. And you could use ice staff of Mother Sorrow or a frost staff of Catalyst with uh, EC. And then you'd have both. Uh, by the way, in that case, if you're doing the Frost Staff front bar EC, you should still do the Shock Enchant. And the reason why is you'll still get flame really often from Blast Bones and from the flame back bar. For your Catalyst, I mean. You'll just have higher Frost uptime than usual because you'll have Frost Bars that have light attacks. Okay, I think, honestly, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If there's any other questions, like... Feel free to ask them now. Like we'll open this setup for like Q and A, but I have a run in like twenty mm -hmm. minutes, so like any trash setup. Trash setups. Trash setup. Yeah, yeah, that's like, a good idea. Like if we're not doing dead water, like that's patch sure. Maybe. So if you're not doing dead water, so this is what I use in trash. Um, all right, so let's see. So this is a good trash setup. Thank you for pointing this out. By the way, this is important. All right, so in trash. Uh, MA, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I use mechanical acuity, and what you do is you have the acuity jewelry three piece. And then you have an acuity back bar staff. So you can proc acuity on the back bar, drop a destro, boom, boom. Swap to front, like, well proc on the back bar, you swap to front bar and then you can start spamming shit. Um, what you have on the front bar is you have the master's lightning staff. And you use that combined with shot clench to get 600 extra spell damage, which is a lot. You have proxy debt for your trash setup, you've got channeled obviously. Front bar looks pretty much the same as as you can see. Like it looks pretty similar to like our just our regular bar setup. The only difference is instead of like degenerate or like uh, ricochet, you have a clench here. Um, yeah. Next pack, she'll probably run something like burning spell weave instead of uh, the dead water though, because yep. you have mechanical acuity. You need just you want something that's gonna give you like. So so already spell personally, power. I actually don't run dead water and trash already. In fact, what I run is robe of succession. Um, oh. Succession is actually, in my opinion, much better than Burning Spellweave. Now, controversial opinion, but I think it is. On a crow, it's worth it because, so as you can see, the five piece gives us 475 spell damage for frost, flame, and shock damage. Now, what do we have a lot of on crow? We have frost damage, we have flame damage, which are wall and blast bones, and shock damage from shock cleave. So we get a lot. The only thing that's not powered up is orb, but like that's that's okay. Orb isn't like I mean, orb is super strong, but like. We're talking about a dot there, and like the dot from orb is only going to gain like maybe 1k DPS from having burning spell weave instead of succession. The other thing that's really nice about succession, if it's not a proc set, or, well, it is a proc set, but like it lasts longer than burning spell weave. Spell weave gives you spell damage for like a little bit. A succession can have 100% uptime, so it's really good. Like you can go into trash and keep that spell damage the entire way through, so it's really, really strong for trash. Um, I use Maw here. Maw, I think, is the best trash helmet. Maybe Groftar is good too, but I think Maw is the best if you're at range for trash because it's just going to cleave everything for free. If you're using Deadwater, though, I would use Baelorg so you can get more damage out of your ultimates. But yeah, so my trash setup. Do you think general... Proxy does look super necessary, though? Like, I just. Super necessary, no, but it is nice to have. Like, I, I think it's worth it because it does do pretty big damage in the beginning, but, like, it's not insane. Uh, what you can do that is... mechanical acuity prac is pretty insane. What you could do is you could have uh, Necrotic Potency over Prox Enemy Debt. Pretty small difference. Prox Debt is pretty insane though. I, I do think with the Acuity Proc, Prox did a ton of damage to start the fight with. And I don't really think there's that many skills you could put there instead, besides maybe Necrotic Potency. I, I actually like the Succession idea over Burning Spell, because I use Burning Spell Weave on, on yeah. my other classes. But uh, yeah, it makes that actually makes a lot of sense to me. That mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Do you yeah. ever have points where your blast bones doesn't go off within the two second skill? Oh, so you, you're like stuck there. Oh yeah, so for trash, um, you're not really doing two skill blast bones as much in trash because a couple reasons. For one thing, a, a lot of trash in the hardest, yeah. Well, so in VKA for instance, trash gets nuked because like everyone's running acuity with destros and stuff. But the other thing is, like, a lot of trash in this game is, like, really freaking scary, man. Like, I don't want to be this close to trash. <laughs> like, it can really hurt. Like, if I'm this close to the tank, there's a good chance I'm going to die. So I'm probably going to be chilling here while I'm doing my trash. And when I'm here, Blast Bones takes one, two, three seconds to go off, right? The other thing is, 
blast bones i can't like if i'm as you can see if i'm looking out into space i can't click blast bones i have to be targeted on something and honestly targeting shit in trash can be really freaking annoying dude like it's honestly like really hard to like target people with blast bones sometimes like in sunspire i'll notice that sometimes i just cannot target anything with blast bones in trash like they either move too much or they die right before i can cast it it's just annoying now am i saying don't cast blast bones no of course not for sure cast blast bones when you can but trash is over in like 30 seconds sometimes so it's honestly better to just like spam wall or like spam clench you can do like blast bones is almost more like a pre-buff like you blast bones you do this let's pretend i had destro i would proc the acuity i'm chilling here i'll proc it again because why not and then i'll just start spamming shot clench and that's gonna be basically it the trash is gonna basically be dead already so yeah like um your rotation changes a little bit in trash it's pretty dynamic like you just kind of do what you want to do it's all gonna it trash is like you want to optimize the sets, but like the actual rotation from trash is just like spam as many AOE abilities as you possibly can. That's really the best way to do trash, in my opinion. It's just to spam wall or spam clench, keep your dots up, and just spam shit. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. If that's it, then uh, thank you guys so much for coming out to the macro class. I hope this was helpful. We went over a lot of stuff. I think this was almost two hours, so this is going to be a long recording for people to watch. Thank you all. And if you ever have any personal questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm a fairly decent macro. crook. I can definitely help you out um, if you're learning the class or want some questions, stuff like that. I'm definitely feel, feel free to DM me privately, and we can always go over anything. So, yeah, thanks again for coming, guys. I hope this was as helpful as I think it might have been. Um,